I'd like to start with a question. And the question is, what do you want to do with your life? It is an unfair question for me to be asking. First of all, I have no idea who you are. I don't have the right to ask you that question. And second of all, because it is 9 o'clock on a Tuesday morning, and who asks those types of questions at this time of the morning? I'll answer that one for you. I'm the type of person who asks that kind of question because it used to be my job. I can see most of you in the audience are sixth formers or probably moving towards sixth form. So it's a question you might be considering, you might have heard a lot in these last couple of months, or if you haven't, you will be considering it in the next couple of months as you reach the end of your school career. So, what do you want to do with your life is a question that was literally my job to ask. I was for five years a coordinator of university applications in the secondary school. So that was my job. I would sit students down in my office and I would bring out this question, what do you want to do with your life? And as I asked that question, I would get the same kind of blank look that I currently see in the audience this morning. So it's good to see that human nature never really changes. It's not a question that I necessarily expect people to have an answer to, but I think it is an important question. It is not, however, the most important question we can answer ourselves. So, while I spent a lot of my time asking the question, what do you want to do with your life? Something else I spent a lot of time doing as this university applications coordinator was read personal statements. It was literally my job to read and help students to improve their personal statements. And I'm going to take a pause here. I'm assuming the majority of you know what a personal statement is. And if you don't, I'm just going to do a quick drive-by. So, a personal statement is 4,000 characters in your university application in which you basically have to prove to your chosen universities that you, among all else, are the person that they want to have in their next academic program. So it's basically where you have 4,000 characters to bring out the big guns, right? You know, all of your academic achievements, your best competitions that you won, the journals that you've read, all your extra curricular reading, all of that kind of stuff goes in your personal statement. So, I read upwards of 300 personal statements in my life. That is a lot of hot water for one to have digested in their life, but digested it, I have. Having said that, there was only one that really stands out to me. One personal statement that I remember to the point that I'm now talking about it four and a half years later. The reason I remember it was because it was the worst personal statement I've ever read in my life. Literally the worst. And I'm going to tell you about it right now. I can see panic in the background of the audience, please don't worry. <laughs> worst personal statement I've ever read in my life. First of all, it was four lines long. 4,000 characters is about an A4 page, right? And it's supposed to be your sort of, your big guns, introduction to yourself, for your university, why you want to have me at your university. So this particular student had clearly not understood exactly what she was supposed to do. So she arrived in my office with 200 characters, not 4,000, 200 characters. And I'm going to recite her personal statement to you right now. Not because I have an amazing memory that I remember it four years later, but because it was really that short. This is how it went. I study hard. Next slide. Uh, I have a part-time job, three nights a week in my local Tesco. I volunteer every weekend with my church group. I pick up my younger brother from school every day and I help him with his homework. That was it, 200 characters. That was her personal statement. Again, she hadn't understood exactly what she was supposed to do in her personal statement. And you can imagine that as I was sitting there, it was my job to get her into university. I was looking at those four lines and thinking, this is the worst personal statement I've ever seen. So I sent this poor girl away with a flea in her ear and a huge to-do list about all the things that she needed to write. But there was something about her personal statement that stuck with me. There was something about that interaction that we had that stuck with me and stayed with me until this day. And the thing that it made me realize was, that while a personal statement is there to show what you can do, what this student had done in her misunderstanding of the task is she had given me a window into who she was. And actually, if you scratch the surface beneath the lines of her four bullet points, her 200 characters, what we discover is, okay, not academic glory. What we see is a person who has worked hard in anybody's life. She volunteers. She's compassionate. She's kind. She picks up her younger brother from school every day. Granted, the jury's still out on that one because probably she had to do it, right? Um, hands up if you've ever been on younger sibling duty, if you've ever had to pick up your younger sibling from school. Yeah, half of you would say you go. <laughs> so that may not have been something that she chose to do, but nonetheless, she did it. She was thinking about the younger brother she went to pick up from school every day. She had a part time job while she was doing her own. That is not an easy thing to do, and she did it. Clearly, she was organised. 
So well, my initial reaction was, but where are the things that you are doing? Where are your achievements? This is not going to get you anywhere. It really made me realize that maybe the most important question is not, what do you want to do with your life? Maybe the more important question is something that she has provoked in that person's statement, which was, what kind of person do you want to be in your life? So, this worst best personal statement put me on a sort of thinking track, and I changed career. Right now, my career, careers, I should say, I have multiple jobs, but all of them are about helping people to maximize their potential as individuals, as human beings. And it is such a privileged position to have, such a privileged position, because now I'm no longer asking the question, what do you want to do with your life? I'm asking the question, what kind of person do you want to be? So this is where my area of particular interest and enthusiasm is. It's in galvanizing people to be the best that they can be so that we can make this world into a better place. Voices for change. So I'd like to shine the spotlight a little bit on what it means to personally change, what it means to personally transform. To answer the question, not what do you want to do with your life, but what kind of person do you want to be in your life? The world is going to transform for the better if all of us know how to better transform ourselves. Now, how do we do that? I'm going to refer back to our worst, best personal statement example. I should, by the way, just say that this girl successfully got into university. She went away, she did her homework, she wrote a cracking personal statement, and all of that is great. It was the first misunderstood draft that she brought to my office that day. And I don't think she understood really what impact it had. <laughs> so, what she had done was she had given me a character statement a statement of who she was as a person, not her achievements that she could put down on paper, but her sort of credentials, her personality credentials. And this is very interesting to me, because when we think about the word character, we might have these associations of theatre, we might have these associations of getting into character, something that is not the person that you are. You have to sort of put on a mask and you take it off. But I'm talking about character in the same way that the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle talked about character. And he understood that character, to have good character, is about the moral dimension of being human. Every single human being has a moral dimension to them. So to have a good character means, in Aristotle's words, to have human excellence. And I really love this idea of human excellence. If you think what it means to be excellent at something, to excel at something, you think about it maybe in terms of grades. I mean, we are in a school environment right now. Um, and you think, what is it that I excel in? What subject do I excel in? And again, maybe the question is, but why do I excel in it? Well, because you put in the hours. It's not something that just came naturally to you and you've been excellent at it without any work whatsoever. Maybe you have a natural gift for it, but you've had to swallow it. You've had to put in the blood and sweat and tears. You've had to do that homework. You've had to research that thing that you didn't have to, but it really supplemented your understanding of the subject. You had to work in it. And that is what brings us to excellence. So when Aristotle was talking about character, he was talking about good character and human excellence, he's talking about that excellence in all of the things that make us uniquely human. So in Voices for Change, the change that I would like to direct our focus on today is what it means to transform into the most excellent versions of ourselves. The people who are going to really change the world, who want to already change the world for the better, are people who have human excellence in spades, in particular aspects of their being, in particular aspects of their personality. And this is something I think that it's good to give time to you to, to consider, to contemplate. So, what is human excellence made of? What is good moral character made of? In Aristotle's view, it's made of something that is called virtue. Now, if you look on the, the list of topics for today, you might have noticed that my talk is titled Embracing Human Virtue. I have no idea what you thought when you looked at virtue. If you were anything like me, you would have thought of something that is kind of a stained glass window in your baby in Victorian, something that's very kind of distant. Or maybe, maybe it didn't mean anything to you at all. Maybe the last time you read the word virtue was in a novel from the 19th century. Usually, we have associations with the word virtue that are precisely that, that are distant, that doesn't really mean very much for us in our modern day and age. But in the spirit of good ideas worth spreading, I would like to highlight the fact that we have never been without the need for people with human excellence, without the need for those excellent character traits that make us excellent humans. 
Maybe this is better explained in examples. Think, if you can, about the kind of person who you know would never talk about you behind your back because they are more wrong. Think about the kind of person who does the right thing even when nobody is watching. That is a person with integrity. The kind of person who makes an effort to be kind even though they're having a really, really rough day. That is kindness. That is patience. The kind of person who does the right thing, even though it means that it might be painful for them. That is courage. So while we may not have any personal association with the word virtue or human excellence, we know in our lived experience that this is something that we need. And perhaps you don't know a person who fulfills all of those characteristics, and if you do, you are blessed. If you can't think of anyone, maybe it's you. <laughs> but I think we can all definitely know that that's the kind of person who is like a beacon of light in this world. That person has human excellence, is growing in human excellence, and this is the kind of thing that I think we all need to pay attention to in our day and age. We want to transform the world on a global stage, on a local stage, on a, on a social stage, a national stage, but real change begins at home, real change begins with us. So, there are three traits of human excellence, or three character strengths that I would like to highlight today, that I think are particularly important tools for each of us who are agents of change in the world. Those three are compassion, courage, and integrity. You may have heard those words, you will have heard those words, they will mean something to you, but let's break them down a little bit. The first is compassion. If we take a look and we dig a little bit deeper at the roots of the issues that we face today, the challenges that we face, I think we will find that a lot of the time, at the roots of those challenges and troubles, is individualism. Not individuality. Individuality is a wonderful thing and leads to a very fruitful diversity and fruitful community in general. Individualism is when we take the ego too far. It's when we go, my needs and my wants are more important than anybody else's. What I want and what I need is going to take priority, regardless of the impact on anybody else. And we see individualism everywhere. It's kind of a part of our human nature, unfortunately. So we see it when, you know, somebody barges past somebody else on the queue to the bus because they can't go to wait. That's individualism. We see it when there is a corrupt government. We see it when billionaires are hoarding wealth to the detriment of their communities. That is individualism. Compassion is the direct antidote to that sickness. Compassion says, I see you, whoever you are, wherever you come from, whatever your background is, whatever your belief is, and I hold you in direct value to myself. Compassion says, I listen, I understand, let me help you. We have some amazing giants of compassion in the history of humanity. Uh, Mother Teresa of Calcutta is one, very household name these days. Um, another one is uh, St. Maximilian Kolbe, who was a Catholic priest in, who was in a concentration camp. And he traded places for a Jewish father who had a family, and this, this Catholic priest traded places with him. He was going to go to the gas chamber. Father Maximilian Kolbe realized that this man had a family, and he managed to trade places. So Father Maximilian Kolbe died, and this Jewish man survived and lived to see this family. Compassion. Compassion is the direct antidote to the sickness of individualism that we have today. Second, courage. Courage, I think we know, it is a, it is a virtue that's talked about a lot. So courage is the character strength that allows us to do the right thing, even if it is difficult. Again, giants of courage in our history. Think of Martin Luther King, we think of Rosa Parks. There are also small, everyday examples of courage that we see when somebody speaks up or when somebody stays quiet, because it's the right thing to do, even though it's hard. Courage is the antidote to cowardice. So cowardice is the thing that makes us shrink into ourselves a little bit. Cowardice is what often leads to individualism and leads to many of the issues that we see today. And the third is integrity. So integrity is the direct antidote to selfishness and fakeness. So I hear an awful lot about how we don't like people being false, we don't like people being fake. There's a lot of chatter about fakeness on social media, which I find highly ironic because it is a highly curated world. 
there is a lot of chatter about it, and we react very kind of viscerally almost to fake news. We don't like it when somebody is too faced. We don't like it when somebody talks, you know, talks the talk but doesn't walk the walk. We don't like it when politicians say one thing and then they go and they do another. Integrity is the character strength of honesty, wholeness, and fairness. The person with integrity is the person who does the right thing, even though nobody is watching. Courage, compassion, and integrity. There are many character strengths that will take forward the transformation of the world. But these three, I think, are going to be particularly strong tools for those who want to be agents of change. And that's everybody here. It is everybody in our local communities. It's everybody in our society has the potential to be an agent of change. There are three last thoughts that I want to leave you with about character strengths today. Number one, that they are ordinary. We often see these heroic demonstrations of courage, of integrity, of honesty, of empathy. They are heroic, and maybe we fall into the trap of thinking, I could never, <laughs> I could never do that. But Martin Luther King's courage didn't suddenly come upon him when he was standing delivering his face and had a dream speech. No, that was like one tiny moment of a life lived of courage. It begins at home in small, ordinary acts of goodness. Virtue, character strengths are ordinary. They can begin here and now in your local communities, with your friends, in your families. Second thought, that virtue is universal, it is open to all. So resources very often are hoarded, or they're very uneasy to access, they're difficult to access for people. Character strength, which is the most powerful resource that we all have at our disposal, can be accessed, can be practiced by anybody, anywhere, independent of financial means, independent of the circumstances that we find ourselves in. You know, you have this really cheesy thing of, you know, the power was in your wall alone. That's actually what we're talking about. It's cheesy, come from Panda style, but it's actually true. We all have the capacity to exercise and practice character strengths. And the third thought, the last thought that I want to leave you with today is actually not mine. I have taken wholesale from the diary of Anne Frank, a 15-year-old girl who we all know was hiding in the Nazi occupation of the Netherlands. And in those darkest of circumstances, she wrote this line, which is like a brilliant light, which I hope will inspire us all. She says, what a wonderful thing that nobody need wait a single moment to improve the world. So if we want to be agents of change, individual, not individualistic agents of change, we can take Anne Frank's words to heart. That improvement of the world can begin now, and it can begin with us. And I invite you to have the courage and the compassion to begin. Thank you.